Hello, thank you for joining me, Carter Brothers, for part two of our introductory class into C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters. By now, I hope you've had a chance to watch part one on the church's YouTube page, where I provided the historical background for the story that I think has particular importance for us today, and we'll address that in some of the later classes in greater detail. But I also wanted to give you, you know, the framework for understanding Lewis's story, because it can be a bit disorienting if you're unfamiliar with it. In the screw tape letters, Lewis has created a set of fictional letters written from the perspective of this old master devil named Screwtape uh, to his apprentice nephew Wormwood, who's out on his first assignment, trying to tempt this man in London who we never know his name, we only know him as the patient, away from God. And of course, from Screwtape's perspective, God is the enemy, and therefore God is referred to as the enemy in the story. So we need to remember that we have to apply a bit of reverse psychology or reverse theology when we read these, story, these letters in order to understand what Lewis is trying to tell us. So I wanna talk about another piece of background information that I think will help you better understand the stories today. But before we do that, I do want to explain the schedule for this class. Because in this day and age of virtual meetings, it can be a bit uh, difficult to understand when do we meet, how are we meeting, do I need to sign up for anything? So let me explain how this is gonna work. Uh, for the rest of October, what will happen is each Sunday, the church will load up a new video uh, that I'll have pre-recorded, looking at some of the major themes in the screw tape letters. And for the month of October, we'll primarily be looking at the characteristics of evil that show up in the screw tape letters. Um, that's a bit coincidental in timing, if you will, because that will be leading up to Halloween. And then on November 1st, which again, coincidentally, or providentially perhaps, is All Saints Sunday, we will have a chance to gather together virtually through Zoom for an afternoon tea time to discuss uh, what we've been learning up until that point. And that will run from four to five o'clock on November 1st. And then for the rest of November, we'll follow the same structure where each Sunday, a new video will be released that you can watch uh, during the week. Um, and then on November 29th, which just happens to be the first Sunday in Advent, we'll have an afternoon tea time from four to five o'clock on Zoom, summarizing the, the book itself and what we've been discussing. If you wish to participate in the Zoom meetings, please email me at screwtapequestions at outlook.com and I'll send you the login information for those two meetings. And of course, as you finish each video, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to share those with me at the same email address. And uh, occasionally I'll ask uh, some questions for you to be thinking of during the week uh, that if you wish to share your answers with me, please do so. You can again email those to me at screwtapequestions at outlook.com. And that's how this class is going to work. So there'll be a series of videos that will be pre recorded. And then we'll have these two opportunities on All Saints Sunday and then the first Sunday of Advent to gather virtually to discuss together this book. So now we're going to look at uh, another piece of information that I think is relevant for understanding the story. But before we do that, make sure you grab your tea or coffee and your book. And we're going to get started with uh, something that I'm calling a friendship for the ages. Again, you don't have to have read any part of the book yet for today's class. All I want you to do is turn to the dedication page. Because when you turn to it, you will see that the screw tape letters is dedicated to J.R.R. Tolkien. And I, of course, can't pass up pass up the opportunity to talk about Tolkien. If you've had more than a five minute conversation with me at any point in my life, you probably have heard me bring up my love of Tolkien, who 
even more so than Lewis, has really shaped my worldview, and in particular, my Christian faith. And that, of course, is always a bit uh, uncomfortable for people because they'll say, Carter, uh, the Lord of the Rings is about dwarfs and hobbits and wizards. What in the world does it have to do about Christianity? Well, I've taught some classes on that at Second Pres, and I hope to teach more in the future, and you can join me there if that's your response. But I hope for you to gather from today's class is there are lots of reasons why Tolkien can be influential in your Christian faith. And we will see the impact Tolkien had, of course, on Lewis, because that, of course, is who he dedicates the book to in 1942 when the Screw Tape Letters is first published as a book. Now, thanks to the movies uh, by Peter Jackson, people are much more familiar today with Tolkien than they would have been, say, 20 years ago. But if you have any biographical knowledge uh, of these two men, I'm hoping that you have an inkling of what others have referred to as the inklings, uh, which was this literary group of, you know, seven to ten men, unfortunately they were always men, who would meet twice a week, once at a local pub called the Eagle and the Child, referred to uh, by the group as the Bird and the Baby, or in C.S. Lewis's model and college room at uh, Oxford. And there, these men would discuss different works that they were writing. And of course, the two main uh, characters in Inklings were J.R.R. R. Tolkien, who's there on the left, and C.S. Lewis, who's there on the right. Uh, and this group met periodically from the late 30s through the early 50s. And there's this <laughs> wonderful quotation that sort of explains uh, what they were doing with the Inklings, where Lewis, um, after he'd befriended uh, Tolkien, is talking about uh, the lack of, of books that they like to read. And so Lewis says to Tolkien, who he, he had nicknamed Tallers, Tallers, there is too little of what we really like in stories. I'm afraid we shall try and write some ourselves. And that's really what was happening uh, during these meetings in the Inklings, where they were sharing the different books that they were writing. But we don't want to start from the Inklings because we have to ask, how did these two men become friends? And it's a fantastic story and one that has particular relevance for our conversation today about friendship. And again, it's a friendship that I, I say is a friendship for the ages and perhaps one of the most important friendships for art and culture in the Christian faith of the 20th century and for folks in the 21st century. So let's see why I think that's relevant. So this is what's so amazing about this friendship. In 1925, two men arrive in Oxford. The first, 27-year-old C.S. Clive Staples, or what CNS stand for, Lewis, but he was referred to by his friends as Jack. And he shows up as a fellow at Maudlin College. Now, it's important to think um, that that's important for this conversation because he's not yet a professor. He comes in as a lecturer where he's going to provide uh, lectures on English literature and he is going to tutor students. And he's single and for our conversation today, the two most important bits of information are he's from Northern Ireland, he's Irish. And he's an atheist agnostic. Now, if you know a little bit about uh, the 19th century, 20th century history of Ireland, you know of the troubles and the divide in between Ireland and Northern Ireland that fell largely along religious lines. Um, and that will come back in just a minute where you would have the Protestant Ulster movement versus the Catholic movement for the rest of Ireland. So just, have that bit of information in the background. Other thing to know about Lewis is he shows up in the English department as a fellow where his expertise is particularly Middle English, uh, the period of the great romance uh, period of England where you have not 
today's romance stories, but the great rom old use of the word romance uh, with Spencer, the Fairy Queen, with Milton, Paradise Lost, with Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales. And he is a bit of a poet himself at this point, but he's largely frustrated with his inability to find success in writing stories and poetry, and he feels a bit uh, stuck. So he shows up at Oxford in 1925, and the same year, so does Tolkien. Now, Tolkien's background's a bit different from Lewis, that's important for us. Uh, one, he shows up at Merton College, and he's already been a lecturer and a fellow up at Leeds University. He comes to Oxford as the Rawlinson and Bosworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon. That's kind of a big deal. And he's very young at this point to be a full professor. And that's because Tolkien is perhaps the most learned man in his field at this point in time. Unlike Lewis, who came into the English department uh, by way of literature, Tolkien comes to Oxford by way of philology. He is a studier and master of language, and in particular, the Northern languages, which of course explains his connection with Anglo-Saxon. Um, for the discussion today, what's important is he is English, versus Jack's Irish, and he's uh, very much a committed Catholic when he shows up in Oxford. Um, so that's their background. And there's this funny bit uh, that Lewis writes about in his autobiography when he meets uh, Tolkien for the first time. He says, when I began teaching for the English faculty, I made two other friends, both Christians. These queer people seemed now to pop up on every, every side. They were Hugo Dyson, who's the woman, person on the right, um, and then J.R.R. Tolkien, who is on the left of this picture. And Lewis says this about uh, Tolkien, who he describes as a smooth, pale, fluent chap. Uh, friendship with Tolkien marked the breakdown of two old prejudices. At my first coming into the world, I'd been implicitly warned never to trust a papist. Remember, that's the Ulster issue of Northern Ireland. And at my first coming into the English faculty, explicitly never to trust a philologist. Tolkien was both. <laughs> so that's the beginning of their relationship. And it's not a very uh, cordial one. Uh, because of these two prejudices that Lewis faces. But we have to ask, well, if we know the ultimate outcome of their friendship, what did they have in common? How did they become friends? And there are two main points of connection. First, of course, is a sad one. Both Lewis and Tolkien were survivors of the Great War. Both were injured and invalided home. Lewis took shrapnel to the chest when he was fighting in France, and Tolkien came down with a severe case of trench fever, which took him months to recover from. So on the left, we have a picture of Lewis holding his pipe, and his friend Patty Moore uh, is the one in the foreground. And during the war, Patty is killed and it changes the trajectory of Lewis's life because he had promised Patty that if something happened to him, he would take care of Patty's mother and Patty's sister. And if you have some familiarity with Lewis's uh, biography and his history, uh, this marks the beginning of this quasi romantic relationship with Patty's mother that Lewis feels responsible for until her death. Uh, that's another class, and we're not going to say anything more about it. The key, port, key point for today is Lewis lost his good friend, Patty Moore, during the Great War. For Tolkien, it's even more traumatic. On the right side of the screen, you've got Tolkien and his uh, great friends. Uh, they're a part of his first literary club, the Tea Club and Barovian Society. Uh, they were all friends in what we would call high school who all went to war together. Um, from left to right, we have Jeffrey Smith, 
We have Tolkien with his very natty mustache. Makes me realize I wish I'd kept mine. Uh, Christopher Wiseman and then Rob Gilson. And we have this quote from Tolkien that says, by 1918, all but one of my closest friends were dead. Because Jeffrey Smith, who's on the left, and Rob Gilson on the right, are both killed during the war. And that was a tremendous blow to Tolkien and the loss of his friendship with these two men. But what draws Lewis and Tolkien together is their love of the great tales of the North. We're talking about the Finnish Kalevala, the great Norse myths that we know today thanks to the Marvel movies with Odin and Thor and Loki, uh, the German Ring Saga, England's Beowulf, which eventually becomes Tolkien's claim to fame. Uh, that's his special expertise. And for today's conversation, Iceland's Eddas, the poetic and prose Eddas. Because what happens when Lewis comes to Oxford, he becomes part of another literary club that Tolkien had started. He actually brought it with him from Leeds called the Kolbitar, which is Old Icelandic or Norse for coal biters. Tolkien had started this club where he's deciding to teach Icelandic to different uh, folks at Oxford and men and um, both related to or not related to the university. And he's going to teach them uh, Icelandic through the, re the reading of the poetic and prose Eddas. Lewis calls it the Icelandic society in several places of it when he refers to it. But the name, the coal biters, is this wonderful word that Tolkien invents that brings to mind this image of uh, one cold wintry night in Iceland, all the village elders and members of the village gather around the fire and someone breaks into a tale of uh, the prose Edda or the poetic Edda. And as the night uh, gets longer and the fire starts to dwindle, the speakers and everyone gathers closer and closer to the coals so that by the end of the night, it's as if the speaker is biting the coals. It's a wonderful image of folks gathered around a fire, and that's going to come back and be referenced in just a short while. But that's the Colby Tar. And when Lewis is introduced to this class, he realizes, wow, this Tolkien is a kindred spirit. Lewis grew up reading and loving these stories. And he writes immediately to his close childhood friend, um, Arthur Greaves, and says, I'm going to uh, paraphrase to today's language, basically says, Tolkien is one of us, right? Here's someone who loves the same things that we love. And so this friendship starts through this love of these great stories. And as time progresses, you know, Tolkien is talking to Lewis about the stories, but he's realizing that Lewis, as the atheist, is having trouble uh, understanding their worth. Uh, for Lewis, in one, one biography, he, he describes some of these great myths as if they were breathed through silver. So they have beauty. They have power. But Lewis says, they're lies, they're, therefore they're worthless. And Tolkien says, no, no, these stories are not lies, my friend Jack. And he proceeds to share with Lewis his great worldview of sub-creation. And this is where Tolkien explains to Lewis, you know, there's one God who is the creator, right? And this will be relevant for some of the later classes on screw tape. But Tolkien describes these uh, writers of these myths, including us, as sub-creators. That when we write, when we create, you know, obviously we're not making out of nothing, we're sub-creating. We are revealing the refracted light through whom, a through whom is splintered from a single white to many hues, so that when these myths that they were reading were being written, God's truth is still coming through them. 
Therefore, they're not lies. They might not be real, but they're still true because of this idea of subcreation. And during this time, and Mythopoeia is a poem that Lewis, Tolkien writes to Lewis explaining the power of myth in the story. And during this time, Lewis starts to appreciate the power of the myths better. And more importantly, Tolkien starts talking to Lewis about the Christian myth and says, essentially, the story of Christ is a true myth. It is a myth working on us in the same way as others, but with this tremendous difference that it really happened. And so Lewis, who's this atheist starting to come alive through understanding of subcreation and the power of these stories, he starts meeting more regularly with Tolkien and with his friend Hugo Dyson. And on one famous night when Tolkien unpacks this great story and his great idea of subcreation, um, in early 19, in September of 1931, Tolkien, Dyson, and Lewis go for this walk outside of Magdalen College late into the night. And they go walking around Addison's Walk at Magdalen College. And this is where Tolkien shares this great idea with Lewis and explains to him that the story of Christ is simply a true myth. It really happened. And within a week, Lewis becomes a Christian. And in his uh, autobiography, Surprised by Joy, he tells the famous story of when he went to the zoo saying, when I left for the zoo, I didn't believe Jesus was the Christ and Lord, but by the time I got there, I did. And, you know, Lewis then writes, you know, Dyson and Tolkien were the immediate causes of my conversion. And let's remember the conversation with the coal guitar. Is there any pleasure on earth as great as a circle of Christian friends by a good fire? You start to feel the importance of this friendship between these two men. And what's remarkable is, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say, without Tolkien, we might not know Lewis. Because from this, from this conversion, all those things that were stuck inside of Lewis just come bursting out of him in tremendous creativity. He starts writing. And of course, if you've read Lewis, it is much as you know, he had this voracious appetite for literature, his writings are, are a tremendous depth and breadth of subject matter. You know, he writes a preface to Paradise Lost, but then he writes a space trilogy, which is essentially science fiction. He writes the problem of pain. He writes about courtly love during the, the Middle, Evil, Middle English period, which is a very academic piece. And of course, he writes Till We Have Faces, which is a retelling of Cupid and Psyche. Um, and then most of us know him through Narnia. But that all happens after the conversion to Christianity. And that's the importance of Tolkien's friendship with Lewis. Now, we also have to ask, what's the impact of Lewis's friendship on Tolkien? Because it's as important, but in a different way. Uh, Tolkien, <laughs> you know, was a curmudgeon. You know, he was very set in his ways. He liked the old rules, the old literature. That's why he was an Anglo-Saxon professor. He preferred mass in Latin. That should tell you a little bit about his personality. And so it's not that Lewis influences him in his way of thinking. He has a different impact on Tolkien because Tolkien at this point um, during his friendship and even before they'd met, but then especially during the 20s and the 30s, had already started writing um, the background history that eventually is incorporated into the Lord of the Rings. We know this background history today through the book, The Silmarillion. These are his ancient myths that he's written about Middle Earth. He largely hadn't shared that with anyone outside of his family. When he starts writing The Hobbit, he's writing it to tell a story to his friends. 
But as his friendship with Lewis develops, he realizes, I'm going to share this very private material with Lewis. And when he does, Lewis just explodes with encouragement for Tolkien. He says, you have to share this with more people. And it's really Lewis who pushes Tolkien to publish these stories. And so when the, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings find this tremendous success, Lewis, uh, Tolkien describes his relationship with Lewis and the importance that Lewis played in the publishing. And so I've got two quotes here that I wanted to read. Lewis warned me long ago that his support might do me as much harm as good. I did not take it seriously. I should not have wished other than to be associated with him, since only by his support and friendship did I ever struggle in the end of the labor. Because The Hobbit is released in 1937, and immediately it finds success, and people are asking for a sequel, and it takes him until 1953 in 54 is when the final part of The Return of the King was published to publish The Lord of the Rings. So for those 15 years, Tolkien is stuck and it's Lewis more than anyone else who's pushing him forward to finish this tale and get it released. And so Tolkien writes, the unpayable debt that I owe him was not influence, but sheer encouragement. He was for long my only audience, only from him, did I ever get the idea that my stuff could be more than a private hobby. But for his interest and unceasing eagerness for more, I should never have brought the Lord of the Rings to a conclusion. So you start to see the importance of this friendship. And on November 22nd, 1963, a date most of us know is the day John F. Kennedy was assassinated um, Tolkien had another blow, and that was the loss of Lewis, who died much younger than Tolkien. And Tolkien's daughter writes to him about the impact of Lewis, Lewis's death. And Tolkien says this, writes this remarkable um, eulogy for his friend. So far, I have felt the normal feelings of a man of my age, like an old tree that is losing all its leaves one by one. A wonderful image of Tolkien. He loved trees, and so, of course, he's associating himself with one. And when his friends have died, it's like a leaf one by one. But this, Lewis's death, feels like an ax blow near the roots. So you can understand and feel the power of this friendship between these two men. And he summarizes this to his daughter by saying, and after all that's happened since, because there were some ups and downs in the friendship that we don't want to talk about, that's another topic, the most lasting pleasure and reward for both of us has been that we provided one another with stories to hear or read that we really liked. Remember that earlier comment about toddlers? We just have to write stories for ourselves. And here you have this great friendship summed up that we wrote stories that we'd like to hear and read. And so from Tolkien's perspective, we wouldn't know him today, but for his friendship with C.S. Lewis. And that's, of course, why it's dedicated to him. So that's the bit of background as we dive into Screwtape to remember that, to remember at the core there's this friendship between these two men that I want us to hold on to as we dive into this uh, book together, because it's a bit depressing at some points to uh, spend so much time reading from Screwtape's perspective. But now, here's what we go to the next assignment. We're gonna start talking about evil. So I want you to think about this question. What do you think evil is. And then, since we're reading a book about demons or devils, do you believe in demons or devils or Satan? And think about how that influences your worldview. And begin reading the book, and by the next class, if you don't want to have spoilers, you need to read letters 1 through 12. 
So as questions come up, please email them to me at screwtapequestions at outlook.com. And I look forward to speaking to you again next week. And until then, go in peace to love this love and serve the Lord. And I remain affectionately yours, your brother in Christ, Carter.